So today I'm going to be talking about Moravian in America, original visions, and long-term costs. Multinational, multiracial, pass, excuse me, multiracial, pacifist, dedicated to social action and to evangelism, and theologically and liturgically creative, the Moravian Church challenged many of the conventions of the European nations, their colonies, and their state churches. That's sort of my thesis statement from a chapter that I wrote about Moravians uh, in North Carolina. There's a forthcoming book from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Press about religious groups in North Carolina. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to write the Moravian chapter on that. And that's sort of my take on, on who we were. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about two different time frames and arcs. And the first one I'm calling a topian vision, which I know is not a word. Uh, many of you are familiar with the concept of a utopia. Um, some uh, in academic circles and sometimes in film criticism and stuff like that, they, they talk about dystopias, futures where uh, it's, a, it's an unwanted, unpleasant future. So it's the opposite of a utopia, it's a dystopia. And so what I will uh, sort of uh, put before us is a chance to look at what was there and you can decide for yourself if you think this was a utopia or a dystopia. So within the first time frame that I'm looking at, that first arc, I'm going to be looking at what happened from 1722 to 1753. And I'm going to argue that they were developing what they called a utopia. Well, they didn't call it a utopia, but it was their vision for things. And the sort of subdividing that into building Heronhood itself, building the choirs, and then developments that came out of the choir system. And one thing that I really hope to, for us all to be thinking about today is that things often take a long time to happen. It's easy sort of to look back and go, oh, the 18th century Moravian church, and think that that was just one group of people that always thought alike and that this idea of what the, you know, what the Moravian church should be just sort of fell from heaven in one piece. But actually it took a long time to develop. After that, Moravians in North Carolina got a chance to sort of live out this utopian vision for about a generation. And today I'm going to be talking some about economics, I'm going to be talking some about the role of women, I'm going to be talking some about the role of race, in particular that slavery played within that. And then talk a little bit about the period from 1790 to 1818 when Moravians actively dismantled the utopia that their forebears had put together. That'll take us up to our first break. The second time frame that I want to look at uh, the second arc of things, I'm going to be talking about developments uh, in uh, America, in the South, in Winston-Salem, and uh, sort of the, under the heading of cotton mills, cars, and changing neighborhoods, and how that impacted uh, what the Moravians in this area were doing, and that's sort of the church that most of us have actually inherited. We didn't build this. We're the ones who were working out of the structures that, that our forebears, our more immediate forebears, developed. And so a couple of particular things that I want to look at with this is the period from 1890 to 1900 and the impact that the Sunday School Movement had on the Moravian Church. Then I want to talk about the, night, the period from 1920 to 1930. Uh, we normally call these the Roaring Twenties, and that was especially true for Winston-Salem. In 1920, Winston-Salem was the largest city in the state of North Carolina. Um, and it's interesting, we got that way by merging. And one of the things that's interesting to note, the Moravian Church has never merged with another church, and it's never had a split, uh, which is sort of interesting among Protestant denominations. And one of the reasons we may wonder is, well, why are Moravians so small? It's because, well, we've just been Moravians. If you look at the ELCA, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, it's a mixture of a whole bunch of Lutheran churches that became that, and there's still other Lutherans that aren't part of that. The United Methodist Church had a lot of people who united to become the Methodist Church. Moravians have never done that. 
The other period I sort of want us to talk about a little bit is the period sort of from 1950 to 1960 and sort of the end of Moravian suburban expansion. This was sort of the last time that we really did this in any significant way. All right, so those are the two arcs that we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna do all that in two hours, I hope. So I wanna begin by starting with the development of the choir system, okay? So most people know that Herrenhut was founded in 1722, uh, and it was founded by refugees, immigrants who came seeking religious freedom, and they came without a plan. They showed up at a guy's estate and asked if they could start building buildings. So they started chopping down trees and started building buildings. And over time, more and more people heard about what was happening and came and joined in. And so Herrenhut was a rather haphazard enterprise. Nobody had a master plan for how this was gonna turn out. And as things went along, various groups developed Following the spiritual renewal in 1727, the single brothers formed the first official choir, and even though there had been groups of girls meeting before that, they hadn't officially organized, but by 1730, there were also the single sisters. So these were groups of unmarried men or unmarried women who gathered together to, work, to study and often to work together. So they're beginning to sort of coalesce Separate housing for the choir system actually begins in the late 1730s. So um, that they, at, at first, once again, as these groups developed, they found places to live together. But by 1739, they said, okay, we will build a single brother's house, and that will be a place specifically designed for single men to be able to live and work and worship together. And then by 1740, they did the same thing for women, okay? Um, the idea of separate housing for married persons was an experiment uh, in Bethlehem uh, that was brought about by Spangenberg during the time that Spangenberg was working with, uh, with Bethlehem. And in that situation, married men lived in one place and married women lived in another place. And I don't have time to go into all the details about that, but it is important to note that there were arrangements made for conjugal visits. Uh, there, were, there were bedrooms in the married women's house. Um, and so it was carefully planned and arranged. So everybody got to be with everybody in the most you know, intimate ways for married folks. A couple things happened when the opportunity was given for people who had been living that way to move into nuclear family housing. Everybody said no. It's sort of like friends with benefits, except you actually are married, and you don't have to put up with that person the rest of the week, right? And so when Friday night rolls around, you're really looking forward to seeing them, and you don't have to have arguments about toothpaste caps or taking out the garbage or anything like that. When they finally forced people to move into nuclear family housing, birth rates went down. Now that could reflect the age of the people who had been living separately and then had to live together. Um, but anyway, um, so it's important to note that that was an experiment that Moravians tried, and actually for a long period of time in Bethlehem. So this is how the choir system really developed, and with the exception of that last piece, this all really develops in Herrenhut. And so now it's time for a shameless plug. We do have a trip coming up to Herrenhut and, uh, and to Prague next summer. Uh, I invite you, uh, if you're interested in that, you can talk to me during one of the breaks, or better yet, call my wife at the seminary who can give you all the details. It's 11 days uh, over July 6th of next summer. You will be back in time for music festival. Okay, all right. So from, I pointed out that Herrenhut is a rather haphazard enterprise, but they learned a lot of things, and from this point on, Moravians are proactive about the communities that they plan and build. And this is a very important thing to note. Moravians are proactive about the communities that they plan and build. One of the most important features of 18th century Moravian uh, congregational life is the idea of the economy. And it's interesting, um, I would 
Just up in Bethlehem last week for the Moravian Historical Society, Paul Poiker presented a paper where he's presenting some, some different looks at the history of the economy than have been standard within the Moravian Church. And so previously, previously what's been said going back at least to people like Levering who wrote a history of Bethlehem and uh, Hamilton picks up on this with the, the history of the Moravian Church arguing that when Moravians had planned communal economies with communal ownership, that this was merely an economic necessity. And it was not part of an ideal that Moravians were really trying to get across. And basically what they're saying is they're writing at a time that there are fears about socialism or communism and they're trying to say, Moravians weren't that. Well, Paul Poiker presents a different take on this saying that actually it wasn't done out of economic necessity. It was actually a pattern that had been established in several additional um, communities before coming here, and that actually the idea of communal ownership really was tying back to some of the precepts we see in Acts, where Christians held all things in common. And so like I said, Paul gave an hour and a half lecture about that last week, and you can find that through the Moravian Historical Society, but I won't go into all the details about that. But I think it's important that he is trying to point out that Moravians really did have intentional, economically grounded, philosophically and theologically reasoned communes. And they actually use the word communa in German rather than the word gemeine for this period. As I mentioned, it was practiced a couple of other places, uh, Pilgeru, Herrenhag, and Herrendijk in um, in, um, in the Netherlands. It was also the attempt in Savannah was going to be a communal economy. So all this happened before the Bethlehem economy and their planned economy. And as Paul points out, this was not only for practical reasons, but also for theological and economic reasons. So choir life, um, in choir life, uh, men and women live separately. And one of the interesting things about that, it means you have to have separate officials and leaders. Because if you've got single sisters living separately, you know, you can't have a guy living there and running things for them. Okay? So um, this is an important development. We're going to see some of the results of that in a little bit. They also worked separately, and this was not uncommon given 18th century divisions of labor, but really, uh, women had really separate spheres of work than men did. Um, and that could be done often within the choir house or within buildings located near the choir house or farms and gardens that were behind choir houses. So if you think about Salem Square, you'll notice that there's this big open area between things and it's like there's men's sides of the square and women's sides of the square. And so where the single brother's house was, their farms and gardens were behind things. Where the single sister's house is now, and where Salem College actually is now, that was originally farms and gardens and work areas for women. So contact between genders was, was really separated. Um, they worshiped separately, which means that there were separate devotions, prayer meetings, worship services, three times a day for single sisters, for single brothers, um, and when they sat in corporate worship, they sat separately, segregated by genders, and of course, buried separately. And this is one of the few things of the choir system that still remains uh, for Moravians in Winston-Salem. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that are developing at Herrenhut. Herrenhog is the next big Moravian town that actually lasts. I mentioned Pilgeru, that was up near Denmark. Uh, it, it did not last. Herrenhag was founded around 1738 and was abandoned in 1750. Um, it, it, it is abandoned after, right, right after the end of the sifting period, and Paul Poiker has a new book out about that that I would hardly recommend because it dispels some of the myths of why this was disbanded. It's important to note that at its heyday, it had a thousand residents. So this was a huge settlement that was built, and this is built in the course of a decade. And it's the headquarters for the Moravian Church of the day. 
for various reasons, Zinzendorf and his family were leaving Herrenhut sort of behind. Some of it was political, some of it was practical. As they looked at their mission work, it's a whole lot easier to work things in the Atlantic world the closer to the Atlantic you are. Go on the trip and you'll see how far away Herrenhut is from the Atlantic. There's some new things that happen at Herrenhog. The first thing about it, 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 is, it is the first planned community. Like I said, they developed all these ideas at Heron Hoot, and then they were able to build a city based on all of these ideas at Heron Hog. The choir system was already in place, but there were liturgical developments that happened at Heron Hog, including the development of wounds theology, which plays a very important role in the 18th century Moravian church, and the idea of the Holy Spirit as the mother of the church. And this is one of the more innovative ideas that the Moravian Church had and widely practiced at the time. The first ordinations of women happened at Marienborn, which is sort of just down the road from Heron Hog. Um, and this is happening in the 1740s. And it's important to note that this is a transatlantic community. A little bit further down the road, I'm going to talk about Rebecca, who is the subject of Rebecca's Revival, which is one of the books back there. Um, she was resident in Herrenhog for a while and actually married while she was there. Um, and it's important to note that this was a transatlantic community. Herrenhut had been international and multicultural, but as they moved to Herrenhog, that becomes even more the case, becoming transatlantic. So um, you can sort of see uh, in the picture there, I hope it's clear enough to see, um, that this is a community that has like a dozen or so buildings that are all the size of the brother's house or the sister's house. Um, built within a decade. And so somebody might ask, who funded this? And we often sort of point out that Count Zinzendorf was a nobleman. And that's true. And the assumption often is, well, he must have had a whole lot of money that he put into making this happen. It is true that Zinzendorf had lands. It is true that his wife, the Countess Erdmut Dorothea Zinzendorf, had lots of lands and family connections. And often in Europe, they built places near her family connections. So they had access to land, but as was the case with many of the nobles, they were often very poor or deeply in debt. And so there's stories of Zinzendorf's wife having to get the silver out of Hock to be able to host dignitaries when they would come to visit, okay? So the idea that Zinzendorf was floating a whole lot of money to make all this happen is not true, okay? So it wasn't exclusively Zinzendorf. And here's the important, piece of this for me. The real, the real place where this happened is that lay people were all in. And what I mean by that is as these communal economies developed, it meant that people didn't receive a salary. It meant that people had a place to live, meant that people play, had a place to work and worship and be taken care of, but they weren't putting the profits in their pockets. The profits went back into the community to help communities like this grow and expand. And it may be easier if you're a poor immigrant, you know, what if you've already left everything behind, it's not like you're giving up a whole lot to join a community like this. But once you join, you know, like I said, all the benefits of your labor go to benefit all the community. We'll talk about uh, some questions related to that at the end of our time together. So I think one of the, when, when people say, well, could we do something different today? And people say, well, we don't have a Zinzendorf to fund it. Well, they didn't have a Zinzendorf to fund it then either. They had a Zinzendorf to lead it, okay? So this is an interior of the main Zoll at uh, Heron Hog. And I put that up for a couple of reasons. Uh, you can see there is separated worship, I hope. Uh, there, the women are all over on this side. The men are all over on that side. It's the typical Zal setup where the pastor is on the long wall. Um, and one of the interesting things that this picture points out is um, there are paintings. On, there's a painting on the far wall. There are paintings on the ceilings. So at this point, Moravians actually had a lot of artwork 
within their sanctuaries, within their zalls. Um, now, it would be interesting to note that the walls were plain and white, and the, the, the artwork could be changed due to the liturgical season. So the idea that Moravians like white walls for the sake of white walls is not true. Moravians like white walls because it's easy to put different pictures up. You know, so rather than having stained glass windows that you can't change, you've got lots of space for artwork that you can change. Okay? Another reason I point that is because within this, there would have been a painting on this wall that was similar to this. This is a cut from a book. And uh, this is um, the risen Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene. Okay, and uh, unfortunately these, these pictures aren't looking very clear, but you can see Jesus' side wound uh, clearly in the picture, and Mary Magdalene is at his feet. This is a post-resurrection appearance. It comes out of the book of John, okay? Um, the only thing that we have that still sort of ties into this real interest in Mary Magdalene, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, the, the one remaining thing that we have is an Easter morning. Yes? Um, who are the people upstairs? Go back to the slide. Uh, see all the people upstairs? They would probably be visitors who were observing. Now, did they have to be um, segregated male and female as well? That I don't know. I'm, I'm, and I, I can't really, it'd be, that would be an interesting thing to, to sort of blow up that picture and look at it a little better. I don't know. Okay. Do they have a separate entrance, I'm not, I, I don't know the layout of this particular building. And um, one of the things that happens, like I said, this is Herrenhag, and Herrenhag was virtually destroyed. There are two buildings remaining, and I don't know, my guess is the Unity Archives. We could go back and look and find plans for it, but yeah, sorry, I don't have a better answer on that. Okay. Um, the, the first hymn that we sing at the Easter liturgy, Hail all hell, victorious Lord and Savior, you have burst the bonds of death. Grant to us, as to Mary, the great favor to embrace your feet in faith. This is a direct reference. This hymn is making reference to, uh, in John 20, the resurrection appearance of, of uh, Jesus to Mary. And that story, the, the particulars of that happen only in John. And that's another interesting thing to note about Moravian theology in the 18th century. It's very centered in the book of John. So it doesn't ignore other things, but it's centered in John. As a matter of fact, when Zinzendorf was looking at uh, publishing a Moravian version of the Bible, he was going to move the book of John to the first book of the New Testament because he thought that was the key to understanding the rest of it. Um, so Mary Magdalene is a very important devotional figure because part of what's going on in 18th century Moravian theology is the idea that we, with our current stages of life, can see ourselves in the biblical story and should, should sort of devotionally put ourselves in those places, okay? So um, how would a, a married mother, you know, a married woman, might understand herself sort of spiritually the way Mary was the mother of Jesus? You know, a single person could see himself, you know, in relation to what it would have meant to have been a disciple and followed Jesus. One of the difficulties is for a single woman, you know, how would you devotionally see yourself in relationship to Jesus? Well, Mary Magdalene's sort of your answer. And there was a lot of Moravian devotional material devoted to uh, Mary Magdalene. And uh, if you look at names, Maria Magdalena is a very common name uh, for Moravian girls at the time. And Julie actually trans found a ton of hymns in the older German hymnals that had never been translated that key into this Mary Magdalene devotional trope, okay? Okay, so we've got the fact that within the choir system, we've got to have women's leadership. We've got the fact that Moravians are lifting up people like Mary Magdalene for understanding uh, the relationship that people might have to Jesus. So this, and I've mentioned that there was the, the idea of the Holy Spirit as the mother of the church. 
So the church is being very theologically creative. It's being practically creative. It's having women in administrative positions. So one of the logical outgrowths of this is that Moravians began to ordain women. And so there are a couple of questions about when thinking about this is who was ordained and who did the ordaining? When were they ordained? Where were they ordained? And how were they ordained? And all of those sort of help us understand what was going on with uh, women's ordination in the 18th century. And I'll say a little bit about that when we come to talk about the 20th century and reinstituting the practice of ordaining women. The one question we really can't answer yet is why were they ordained? Especially when it comes to questions of um, uh, another category, they were ordained as deaconesses. So I want to unpack that a little bit. Um, Hamilton notes that at the Synod of uh, 1745, as I mentioned, in Marion born, they begin, it says the last sentence there, Achilles and deaconesses were again introduced to the church. So it points out that there was something coming out of the ancient unity in terms of women's leadership and that they were reinstituting a forgotten practice, okay? Um, and note the term, ac oh, I don't have that up there. There we go, sorry, looking at the wrong slide. Achilles and deaconesses were again introduced into the church and the term there that's really important is deaconess. Um, a lot of people have been writing uh, after this has become more well known, this is a topic of real academic interest. Catherine Fall, um, in her book Moravian Women's Memoirs, which was published in 1997, has memoirs of several women who were ordained as deaconesses. So you can find out more about their lives. And she's also done some work uh, in, related to the role of the speaking, which was a meeting that you would have with spiritual leaders prior to communion. Um, sort of to make sure that your heart was in the right place and that you were settled in your relationship with God before you went in to, to communion. Um, another person who's written about this uh, is Peter Vogt, uh, who's currently the pastor, uh, he and his wife Jill, are the pastors at uh, Herrenhut. And he points out that 420 women served as acolytes or acolutes, and they often had um, I mentioned the speakings. They were the kind of people that could hear people and talk with them about their spiritual journey and how they were doing. Some of these women who were acolytes were then ordained as deaconesses. And being ordained as a deaconess at least allowed you to participate in the distribution of the elements of communion. And we've sort of got woodcuts that prove that. Unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of writing Moravians were later embarrassed by a lot of things that were going on at this time and burned a lot of documents. And so unfortunately, we don't have a manual that says, yes, when a woman's ordained a deaconess, she can do this, 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 and this. So we have to piece together things. Um, but 202 women were ordained as deaconesses during the Zinzendorf's lifetime. So that's roughly 1745 to 1760. An additional 14 women were ordained as priestesses. And here's another thing, we don't know exactly what that means, but I've got a woodcut that for me raises some interesting questions. And once again, this was all by 1760. Another thing that's really interesting about Peter Voke's work, and I think this is really relevant to some of the issues that we face within the Moravian Church today, he notes sort of like a 20 year period as Moravians began having women in leadership positions, then to getting them ordained, um, that he, he becomes increasingly favorable in terms of women speaking and worship leadership roles. Um, and he, he notes how Zinzendorf changed the scriptures he was paying most attention to. So originally he sort of starts out with Paul saying, I forbid a woman to speak in church and sort of acknowledges that that's there. But over time, he gets more and more and pays less, pays less attention to that and notes more just all the lists of women who are listed at church workers in Paul's letters. And looks at, you know, talks a lot about Priscilla. So what's interesting is he sort of changes the groundwork for the conversation over time, okay? Another person who's written about ordained women is Beverly Smaby. Um, 
And uh, there was a there was a conference back around 2000 at Wake Forest, and there was a book that came out of that. One of her articles is this one: "No one should lust for power, women least of all." And I agree with her on some things, but I also disagree with her on a couple things. She used a lot of official documents, synod uh, references, minutes, and stuff like that. And that's good that she did that. She looked at the synods of 1764, 1769, and 1775. These are all synods that were held in Herrenhut, and they're all held right after Zinzendorf died, and the church is kind of having a power vacuum, and they're figuring how they're going to move forward. One of the things that she notes is that women no longer participate in ordaining other women. So prior to this time, what had happened was when a woman was ordained a deaconess, and we have record of this happening here uh, in North Carolina, that there would be a bishop there who would do the ordaining, but when it came to the laying on of hands, the bishop's wife was the one who was actually laying hands on the woman. Once again, that's something normally bishops do, is lay hands on. So we've got a couple of women who are functioning kind of like bishops. And over time, the Moravian church backs off, backs off of that part of the practice even before it stops ordaining women. So like I said, there's these trajectories of you know, empowering women, investing them in places of power, and then over time dismantling that before they completely stop it, okay? Um, well, some of the things that I, I sort of disagree with her, if you use Lebenslauf, which is, you know, things that people write, it's sort of more a people's history almost, you get a slightly different picture that points out it didn't die out quite as quickly as she argues uh, it does. Um, and also, she seemed to act like Zinzendorf was the only man who really advocated for women's participation in spiritual administrative affairs, and that's simply not true. Um, that Zinzendorfian vision, uh, a lot of other men bought into it. So this wasn't just a crazy idea that Zinzendorf had, and as soon as he died, everybody's like, okay, great, now we can get back to business as normal. A lot of men embraced this vision for women's leadership. Vernon Nelson, who was, was the pro, uh, provincial archivist for the Northern Province, um, had, has written an article, and he points out that 48 women were ordained in America alone. So lots of women were ordained here. It wasn't just something that was happening somewhere else. He also points out that Moravian elderesses, they ordained other women. They were the ones that were laying on hands. One of the things I like that he points out is that during the Count's lifetime, the Moravian church was becoming more radical in the roles it was creating for women rather than backing off of it. And that's, uh, that's another sort of long-standing historical argument. Did Zinzendorf sort of get too crazy and then say, wait a minute, we gotta stop this? And it's like, no. He actually continued this trajectory. And here's one of the things that Vernon Nelson points to. Count Zinzendorf called for the public ordination of women as priestesses, which they had been doing in private in 1758, and that's just two years before he dies, okay? So he's saying, we used to do this thing and we were sort of afraid to let people know about it, but now he's saying at the end of his life, we, we need to do this in public. We don't need to be ashamed of it. This is who we are. And there are indications that at least two women were or functioned as bishops. Okay. Another person who's written about this is Ingeborg Baldoff, who was a former archivist in Herrenhut in a book called Sisters Behind the Table. She lists from the period of 1745 to 1729 that women were ordained in at least 29 different locations. So one of the things I think is really important about knowing, to point that out, is it's not just, okay, this was a crazy idea that happened in Herrenhut. Now this happened all over everywhere in the Moravian world. These 29 different locations take place in Europe, the British Isles, West Indies, and in North America. In Pennsylvania, it happened at Bethlehem, Philadelphia, Heidelberg, and actually that's where the people who founded Friedberg came from the Heidelberg community, so it happened there. Gnadenhuten. 
Thank you. Um, and, and several other places in Pennsylvania and in North Carolina, it happened at Salem and Bethabara. And during this 45 year period, there were 379 women who were ordained as deaconesses. This is a huge number of people. And just to put it in a little bit of perspective, in 1790, there were 1,162 members in all of the Moravian churches in North Carolina. So, it's points of comparison, okay. So, during the Zinzendorf's lifetime, they were ordaining women from, and one of the things that's interesting to note is what it meant to be ordained, period, even for a man, was sort of a question that the Moravians had to wrestle with because there was this question, is, are, are we a denomination? Are we a spiritual renewal movement within the state church? You know, are we part of the ancient unity still? So Moravians were juggling these ideas for the first 20 years of their existence, okay? And so that's why I've got this date of, uh, it, we, we definitely have record of a woman's ordination in 1745, but there's also this thing that happens in 1743 that sounds kind of like an orda ordination, and this woman later was called a deaconess. So for about 15 or 17 years, during the Zinzendorf's lifetime, they were ordaining women, 202 of them, and women participate in the ordination. In the time after Zinzendorf dies, and it's important to note, like I said, there's this huge power vacuum because Zinzendorf's son dies in 1752. He's sort of the spiritual and sort of legal heir apparent to the count. He dies in 1752. His first wife dies in 1756. He dies early in May of 1760. And his second wife, Anna Nitschman, dies late in May in 1760. So it means there's just power vacuums everywhere in the Moravian church and they're trying to figure out how are we gonna, how are we gonna go forward. But for 30 years, they continued to ordain women. Yes? Are you gonna talk about Spangenberg's theology around all this? Not really. Um, what I would say about Spangenberg and Craig Outwood's done a lot of work related to this. Spangenberg is the one who's the architect of the dismantling of much of this. But it's interesting to note that earlier in his lifetime, Spangenberg had in some ways been more progressive than Zinzendorf was. And over time, and I think a lot of this is due to cultural pressure that's happening within the state churches of Germany, the, the Moravians back off of things. And like I said, it is Spangenberg who oversees all that. Um, there's still 177 women who are being ordained after the Zinzendorfs die. And one of the interesting things to note is they change the verb that's used. Originally, uh, when women were being ordained and having hands laid on them by another woman, the word used was ordinert, ordained. It got changed to eingesegnet, the women were blessed to be deaconesses. And once again, the women couldn't lay hands on. So for, once again, a Salem example, uh, a North Carolina example. In 1773, Gertrude Groff, who was the wife of Bishop Johann Michael Groff, there are women who were ordained in 1773, and at that ordination, the word used is ordinert, and she lays hands on people, on the women who are being ordained. In 1786, which are the last ordinations that happened in North Carolina until Carol Foltz was ordained, Benigna Zinzendorf, so the daughter right, of, the, of the count, she's married, but she, and she's married to Bishop Vautville, so he's the one that does the ordination. So even a Zinzendorf woman can't lay hands on a woman at ordination anymore. And the term is, that's used is that eingesegnet. They're blessed to be deaconesses. They're not ordained deaconesses. So like I said, you can sort of see that Moravians built this up and over time let it go away. And here are a couple of pictures of people who were ordained women. This is Gertraud Graf, who I mentioned, and she's the one that laid hands on the three women uh, when they were ordained in uh, 1773. And this is her main counterpart here, uh, Hedwig Elizabeth von Marshall, um, who was the wife of Frederick Marshall, 
Okay, so I mentioned that Moravian women were being ordained in a lot of different places, and all of these women, including two of the people I just showed you, Gertrude Groff and uh, Hedwig Elizabeth Marshall, they were ordained in Germany, but they came here and functioned as deaconesses. Okay? Another name worth noting is Johanneta Maria Etwein. Um, she came to Bethabara in 1779, and she's the first deaconess to arrive here in North Carolina. Her husband was the head of Bethlehem during the American Revolution. It's a very famous up there, uh, but they did have a brief stay here in North Carolina. She was the first deaconess to arrive. Did you have a question? Okay, um, uh, no, they did not have to be married. They generally were. And so um, let me point out a couple of names here. So um, these are the women who were actually ordained in Salem or in North Carolina. The first ones were actually out at Bethabara. Um, so, so as you might guess from that first name, Rosina Kasky Beefel Backhoff Schmidt, um, she was married a couple of times. <laughs> Um, and she and her husband, Ludolf Backhoff, were um, ordained at the same time, 1773, to serve Friedberg. Okay, so, um, so she was married. Uh, when you look down in 1781, Anna Maria Quest was never married. And she was ordained specifically to be a deaconess for the single sisters in Salem. And so she would have carried out all her spiritual authority within the single sisters house. And the same thing is true with Johanna Elizabeth Culver. Okay, so single women could be ordained, but they did practice, uh, their leadership was solely within the single sisters sphere of things. Um, another interesting name is Anna Katerina Antes Calberlin Reuter Heinzmann Ernst. Um, she was married to the doctor who died in the epidemic at Bethabara, and then she was married to Reuter, who has the famous map in the archives, and was also the guy who laid out Salem. Um, when she married for the third time, uh, he was the pastor out at Freed Land, and so they became the pastoral couple for Freed Land. Um, and interestingly, um, when he dies, they send another guy out there. He becomes the pastor for Friedland. And at some point, I can't remember if it's after Heintzman dies or after Ernst dies, she's sort of the sole ordained person out there. And so one of the interesting questions that we have about this is what about consecrating the elements? This, we need to dig into this more but my guess is uh, that if there was a time that women were carrying out sacramental functions within the Moravian Church in North Carolina, it would have been at that period when she was out there on her own. Now, I can't prove that, um, and I'm not sure we could find it even by digging through stuff in the archives, but that's, that would be sort of the best guess. Okay. There are also a couple of women that... Um, uh, the last one, uh, Katerina B. Ross Steiner, um, is listed as a deaconess in some places, but we don't have a record of her being ordained a deaconess. The other two women were at Bethabara. They were married, um, and this was at a time when many, many pastoral couples, the women were ordained as deaconesses. We don't have a record of them being ordained, but it would be very unusual if they weren't. So that's something for future research. So um, we'll skip over that one. Here's to me a very important uh, uh, question and, and why, why I wonder why were women made priestesses, okay? So this is a woodcut um, and once again in the balcony we've got people looking down at what's going on. It's interesting they are segregated by gender in this one. Um, so you've got men on the left side, women on the right, and you can see uh, in the center aisle, you've got deacons who are distributing the elements. 
up at the far, you know, on, on the far right side, there is a woman who's all in white. So she's in a surplus and she is called a deaconess and she is helping distribute the elements. The guy in white at the center table, presiding at, officiating at, consecrating the elements, is called the priest. So here you have a priest officiating at communion, and it's the deacons and deaconesses who are doing the distributing. I wonder if that means when women were made priestesses, they also could do this. Now, I can't prove that. I don't have the document that says this is why people became priestesses. But this makes me at least raise the question. Okay, so I, I, I would love to find a document someday that says this is why they became priestesses. Ironically, one of the places we might turn it up someday is at the archives in Suriname in Paramaribo. There was a mission to Paramaribo very early on. And um, I'm wondering maybe if they have documents that they preserve there that Moravians elsewhere destroyed. Because like I said, uh, under Spangenberg, they burned a lot of stuff. So, all right, so to wrap this up and move on to some other things, there were 10 women ordained in, in, in Wachovia. Um, there were 10 who served else, or ordained elsewhere who served here. All six of the 18th century congregations, which are Bethabara, Bethania, Salem, Friedberg, Friedland, and Hope, with the exception of Hope, all these congregations were served by ordained women, and most of them had several ordained women. So it was the norm. One of the reasons I point that out is I think it's quite possible that girls growing up in Salem would have thought someday I might be a deaconess. And our church stopped doing that practice. Okay. Yeah. Is the, the exceptional thing about hope that it was an English speaking congregation? It, I mean, that is exceptional about it. It is the only English speaking congregation at the time. Um, <sighs> One of the difficulties with hope is um, th there's no, in a way, there's no other way that it's different from the other ones, though. You know, so why would language have been an issue with having uh, a, a woman out there? It may, and like I said, it may be that I turn up with further research that somebody had served out there that we haven't realized or something like that. And it may just, it, it, part of it too, is that hope is really organized later than the rest of them, and the practice is sort of dying out over time. So I think it's probably more that reason than the language issues. Because as I'll show in talking about some race issues, hope was very much like other congregations, okay? All right, so, um, and sort of to sum it all up, this was a policy. This is the way Moravians did things. Okay. Um, yeah, once again, sort of from a, just one more sort of closing thought is Moravian congregations were served by more women ordained after the Zinzendorfs died than before. So like the idea that this was some crazy idea that the Zinzendorfs had and then everybody, you know, jumped ship as soon as possible. Mm -mm. And that's part of my reason for arguing that Salem really is the epitome of the Zinzendorfian vision for things. That the, uh, no Zinzendorf, well, there's some Zinzendorf descendants who made it to Salem, but Zinzendorf, his wife, never made it here, all right? So it's not like they had a personal presence that imprinted the community, but the fullness of the vision was built in and lived out here, okay? All right, I wanna talk a little bit about race for a bit. So we had John Sinsbach here earlier in the year, and I'm not gonna go into any great detail about the things that he talked about, but there are a couple of particular examples I wanna point out. His books are back there. Um, so I wanna say a little bit about Rebecca. 
She was an African-American woman born in the Caribbean, joined the Moravian Church in St. Thomas, and she was an evangelist, so a traveling evangelist. And that's another interesting thing to note, is that Moravians in the Caribbean and later here in North, uh, in North America, particularly around out, out of the Bethlehem communities, sent out teams of traveling women evangelists. And to me, the, um, the best thing coming out of uh, Aaron Fogelman's book, Jesus is Female, is the fact that he points out that Moravians were subject to violence because of this practice. And it probably even impacted how they chose, what routes they chose to take traveling between Pennsylvania and North Carolina. So the idea of having traveling female evangelists really got them in trouble, okay? So she was one of these female evangelists, but she was later ordained a deaconess at Herrenhog. Uh, she died serving as a missionary to West Africa. And to me, the interesting thing is she is a poignant alternative to the racial attitudes that we developed here. She's what we could have been. Another really interesting book is by Scott Rohrer. It's called Hope's Promise, and, and here's where I was talking about, in some ways, Hope was very much like the other country congregations of Friedberg and Friedland, um, and notice the ways that German and English Moravians sort of figured out how they were going to do things. Uh, he notes things about changes in language usage and acquisitions, about how land and property uh, is acquired and distributed, and he argues that Moravians developed a distinctive culture in this area, and a lot of this was related to how they dealt with race. And part of what he does is el elaborate on extensive kinship connections among African American communities at Hope and Bethania. And it's interesting that Bethania is sort of reclaiming some of this and trying to reach out more to the AME Zion Church in the area for Thanksgiving services, watch night services, and stuff like that. Um, so Moravians, once again, had some very progressive notions that they backed off of. I won't say a word about Christian. He is one of the slaves uh, who was here. He was born in Guinea and bought by the Moravian Church in 1771 not bought by an individual Moravian, but bought by the church in 1771. And at that point, they guessed he'd been born around 1739. He was baptized into Bethabara in 1780, and he was welcomed with the kiss of peace. Now, one of the reasons I point this out is it shows how even though he was a slave owned by the church, within the church, he was treated completely like another brother. And so once again, this is an interracial, interracial same gender kiss of peace. And the same would have been true for any other African American welcomed in the community. They would have been welcomed with the kiss of peace. That was what brought them into the community. And so at any subsequent time when the kiss of peace would be exchanged, you have this interracial contact. And this was where eventually people began to say, you know, how does this look to the neighbors? Is the, what was being said. At least that's what was being said. It's also interesting to note in terms of treating African Americans just like you treat any other Moravian. The memoirist described his death as a home going. That was the German way of talking about it, home going. And and I, I, personally, I like this, it's really cool. Uh, it was the first of any death in Bethabara to be announced by the trombone choir. And part of that is, it took them a long time to get a whole set of trombones down from Bethlehem, <laughs> all right? So, um, but once again, you know, the trombones arrive. There's a death in the congregation, we play. Does it matter that the person's African American? No, okay? It's also interesting to note that at Bethabara, we have records of enslaved Africans owned by the church once again, directing the work of free white people. 
because he knew what he was doing. So within the choir system, he was the person with the expertise of what was going on in the field. So he's the one calling the shots. Okay? We, we move very, very far away from that. But that's where we were when we were starting. Okay? So when it came to race, we had a very inclusive, although it, it inherently sort of convoluted approach to things, but inclusive, welcoming, full members of the communi community. Some were given their freedom. Um, some slaves chose not to join the Moravian Church. They were not coerced to do so. So my point, though, is very racially inclusive to start with, and Zinsbach sort of uh, lays the, you know, the dismantling of that as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so there are a couple of really tricky issues related to that because Moravians in general had encountered slavery in the West Indies, obviously well before that, and their choice was not to come out as like radically abolitionist because they knew they wouldn't be able to work with slaves if that was their stance. So they sort of had to walk a fine line with that. When they got to Salem, so... The good part about Wachovia is, after years of persecution and you know threats of uh, having to um, you know be sent into exile and stuff like that, Moravians had ten thousand acres in the middle of nowhere. The difficult part about Wachovia is they had ten thousand acres in the middle of nowhere, so they were going to build this grand community, but who was going to do it? And so they originally didn't have the personnel that they needed here, and there were very few people around to be able to provide labor. They couldn't hire people, so they hired slaves. Okay, and originally these were slaves owned by the few people around here. And I need, I need to go back to try to verify this. I've at least heard, you know, that slaves liked the way they were treated by the Moravians better than they were by their masters, so they would ask to be bought by the Moravian church. I found it interesting also talking to people who are around in the segregation era too, just sort of to hear different stories of how Moravians here negotiated that. Um, because, um, you know, I, I don't think there were many Moravians on the front lines of civil rights marches or things like that. But I also know of businesses in the African American community that as there was white flight, those businesses just remained anchored and dealt with the, the people who happened to be their neighbors and were respected. And when there were riots here, their buildings were left untouched when other ones were burned. So I think there's a lot of, there, there'd be a lot of things to check into about, you know, how do you quietly work for change by pointing out what conditions are, you know, because you're able to be in them without being the standard bearers. Um, the other thing I would say is the, the decision to buy slaves was controversial and they sought advice from other people, should we do this or not? And um, yeah, I need to reread Zinsbach on that. I'm sure it had to have been submitted to the lot too. Yeah. So, um, so that's one of those things. And, and so, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Are we going to take a 10-minute break? Yeah. Okay, so really quickly. It's also important to remember that at this time, 
there was a lot that was up in the air in terms of free and not free. By 1865, you get to free or slave. For most of American history prior to that, there were various degrees of bonded servitude. And many white people for periods of their life were technically not free. And it's important to remember that in a communal economy, there's a question of how free are any of the white people around here too. Because you might be pretty strongly persuaded, okay, you need to go be the shoemaker in Bethlehem now, or you're gonna go to Lidditz. And so the question of self-determination within that is interesting. And so, like I said, and, and, and many people in their Lebenslauf would describe, they would say, I became the property of the savior. Okay, so like I said, where we wound up in 1865 is not where we were in 1771 when, uh, when Christian was bought. Okay, so a couple of other things to note. Uh, Adelaide Fries um, translated tons of diaries and we talk about telling the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, here's what uh, I wanna point out about Fries. Um, she begins her first volume on November 17th with their journey down here, and she translates everything in the diary for about three months. And then she, as the editor of this, had to make some decisions because there's just so much stuff there. So what she said is, beginning in March, only those entries are translated that show the progress of the work. So she's saying, I'm only gonna tell you certain things and leaving the reader to mentally insert a lot of stuff. And it'd be really helpful if she translated these other things so we'd know more about what's going on. So one of the things, so here's, here's an editorial decision. Bethabra celebrated something called the Mutterfest, which is the celebration of the Holy Spirit as the mother, uh, on December 19th. So they celebrated this, but Freeze never mentions that festival. Okay, the entire entry for December 19th reads, the services for the day had special reference to the work of the Holy Spirit. That's true, it's true. It's not the whole truth <laughs> and, it's, and yeah, it's nothing but the truth is what that is. It's nothing but the truth, it's not the whole truth and it even presents it in a way that's misleading about what the truth is. Because the truth is, there was a full page journal entry that day with references to the Holy Spirit as mother and the maternal nature of the Holy Spirit. They prayed a prayer called the Te Matrim, which Craig has translated. The references to Mama, which was the nickname for the Countess von Zinzendorf. Um, and on the following year, Brother Joseph Spangenberg, once again, the guy who later dismantled all this stuff, came down and there's another full, whoops, another full page, page journal entry about why we should be doing this. Uh, and I'll skip that one. Okay, so here's the so what. Moravians brought a communal economy which included education, health care, housing, economic viability for everybody, even if you're a single woman in the 18th century, which is normally, you're not an economically viable unit as a single woman in the 18th century. But here, it's fine. And they gave it up, okay? Moravians ordained women and stopped. We brought a racially inclusive vision and lost it. We bought a creative inclusive theology and buried it. We were pacifists and we've wound up fighting each other. There's evidence that Moravians from Salem and Moravians from Bethlehem were across the battlefield from each other at Gettysburg. And once again, at the Moravian Conference in Bethlehem just this past week, Hans Bayat Modell gave a great paper and he was talking about how the Moravians in Germany bought into Hitler. And they have not been willing to talk about this for a long time. But it's important to remember that we bought into American service as well, okay? Um, so that's where we were, okay? So I'm gonna close with this slide. To be American in 1789, according to the Constitution, to really count, to have a voice, as in a vote, voting privileges were to free, which 
essentially meant white, men, which really meant men, who owned property. And this points out that in the American vision of 1789, capital is more important than personhood. What you own is more important than you are even if you're a white male. Because if you're a free white man that does not own property, you still cannot vote. And I point this out to say that in 1789, to be an American is an unmoravian thing to be. And with that, we'll take a break. <laughs>